So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us virtually um, as we adapt our lunchtime expedition series uh, in the time of Corona. Um, this format is a little bit different for us, um, but we are broadcasting today's presentation over Zoom webinar, um, as well as feeding this broadcast to Facebook Live. Um, during uh, this presentation, please feel free to uh, submit your questions to Zoom's Q&A feature. Um, or on the Facebook Live platform, um, and we will relay those questions uh, to our speaker. Uh, the support for these programs um, has been made possible by the Nancy Carroll Draper Charitable Foundation, as well as uh, Sage Creek Ranch. Um, these sponsors help make everything that we do possible. Um, we're also grateful to you, the audience, um, for your feedback and your, uh, your support. Um, for these programs, um, like the Lunchtime Expedition Speaker Series. These are uh, presentations, there we go. Um, we are recording these presentations and they will be uploaded to our Draper YouTube channel. So if you just go to youtube.com and search Draper Natural History Museum, you'll find all of our recorded presentations there, as well as presentations from 2019 and 2018. Um, if you'd like to be added to our email list um, for, uh, for upcoming Lunchtime Speaker Talks, uh, please email me at coreya at centerofthewest.org. That email will be up on uh, an outro slide at the end of this presentation. Um, so just feel free to email me your name and your email, and we'll add you to that listserv. Um, we've also started to include links uh, from previous talks um, in these emails, so that's another good reason to, uh, to subscribe and sign up. Today, uh, we are going to hear from Dr. Charles Peterson, who has worked extensively with both reptiles and amphibians for most of his career. Uh, Dr. Peterson is a professor of zoology um, in the Department of Biological Sciences in Idaho State University, as well as an affiliate curator of herpetology in the Idaho Museum of Natural History. Peterson holds a Bachelor of Science as well as a Master of Science degree in zoology at, from the University of Illinois, uh, Urbana, and, and uh, a PhD in zoology at Washington State University. Peterson has conducted herpetolo herpetological training sessions for many agencies and corporations and is very involved in outreach education activities. Um, his research interests include the spatial, physiological, and conservation ecology of amphibians and reptiles. Peterson's work focuses on reptile populations on Idaho's Snake River Plain and on amphibian populations in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. He is currently working on a citizen science project, uh, multiple citizen science projects utilizing the iNaturalist mobile application to document the distribution and activity of amphibians and reptiles in Idaho and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Peterson. Thank you, Corey. So let's see if I can get everything up here. Okay, is my uh, PowerPoint visible to you? Yes, sir. Okay, great. All right, so we're going to be talking about uh, five species of amphibians that are known to occur in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, here's an outline for what I'll be presenting uh, this afternoon. I'll start out with just a checklist of the Yellowstone amphibians to give you an idea of what's, uh, what's present and a little bit about their uh, systematics. And then we'll go through uh, species by species and I'll tell you how to identify them and information about their natural history, like their distribution and their habitats and their activity patterns and movements, uh, feeding, reproduction, things like that. And then along the way I'll mention uh, about their status uh, and trends. And then I'll finish up, uh, most of it will be the species accounts, but I'll finish up uh, talking about the Greater Yellowstone Network Amphibian Monitoring Program. This is a program, uh, a long running program, uh, almost 20 years now, uh, by the National Park Service. And then I'll uh, finish up with just a few comments about iNaturalist and how we're trying to use that platform to gather distribution data on amphibians and reptiles in the greater Yellowstone. And I'll 
tell you a little bit about where you can go for further information and then have a session here for questions at the end. But uh, I believe you can submit questions uh, to uh, either Corey or Nathan as we go. And if, and if that fits in with the presentation at that time, then I'll try to answer them uh, as we go. Okay. All right, so here's the, here's the, the checklist. Um, there are five species that have been confirmed in, uh, in Yellowstone National Park. And I started working in the park back in 1988. And at that time, we there was a report of spadefoots being in the park, but they hadn't been documented. It hadn't been confirmed yet. And it wasn't for, gee, another 24 years before that ended up being confirmed. That's a species that's very limited in distribution in the park and they're kind of a, a secretive species. So that wasn't, we didn't know about that one until recently. But there are mole salamanders in the family Ambystomatidae, uh, the western tiger salamander, Ambystomum mavorsium. There's uh, one species of true toad in Yellowstone itself. That's the western toad in the family Bufonidae, the true toads. And then there's the plain spadefoot I mentioned that's uh, in the American spadefoot toad family. Uh, there's one tree frog, a member of the tree frog family, the hylidae, and that's the boreal chorus frog. That's the one that you're hearing all around now that's calling so loudly. And then uh, the Columbia spotted frog, which is the one species of true frog that occurs in Yellowstone. Now to the east and to the south, and at least in the past to the north, I'm not sure what's in, in Montana right now, but there was the northern leopard frog too. And northern leopard frogs used to be found, oh, in the Targhee National Forest, just west of uh, Yellowstone National Park, and also down in uh, the um, Tetons, but they haven't been documented in over 25 years. Uh, in, in in those areas, probably uh, were victims of the uh, of a fungal disease, uh, chytrid uh, fungus. But there's still a possibility they might be down in the southwest corner of Yellowstone. So uh, we always keep our eyes out and hope we may get to see them there again sometime. Okay, so here's our first species, the western tiger salamander. Um, this used to be one species that kind of went from coast to coast. It was just called the tiger salamander. But within, oh, I think about the last 10, 15 years, uh, herpetologists uh, broke it up and they took what was formerly a subspecies, uh, Mavorsium, and elevated that to full species status. So we call it the Western Tiger Salamander or the Barred Tiger Salamander is the common name now. Okay, and uh, since it's the only species of salamander that occurs in Yellowstone, it's uh, quite, you know, it, it's relatively easy to identify. As a salamander, most salamanders have four legs. Their name, uh, uh, the name of the group, the order they're in, the caudata or the uridella, refers to the fact that they have a tail in contrast to frogs and toads that don't have tails. And the skin is uh, smooth and fairly, uh, fairly moist. Um, we can tell these from other salamanders. Uh, it's a moderately sized uh, salamander, gets up to about, uh, oh, well, actually fairly large for a salamander, up to over a foot in length. Here you can see one in the hand. This one was found up on Togwiti Pass uh, in, in Wyoming. Uh, they have these uh, costal grooves on the side that are folds. This represents, these are 
corresponding to the vertebrae and, and, and the ribs and the muscle blocks uh, there. But those folds, uh, these are called costal folds and these uh, depressions in between them are called the costal grooves. And that's a, that's a um, prominent feature for them. They're highly variable in color but they usually have olo to yellow, either bars or blotches on the back. They've got a rounded head, their eyes protrude and, and, and relatively smooth skin. So a, a relatively easy species uh, to identify. Uh, you may also find them as larvae and, and I'll show you a picture of those in just a second, but this is the adult. Uh, here are a few photographs just giving you an indication of the color variation. Now this picture actually came from Washington, but uh, here's, here's one from down in, uh, down outside of uh, Old Faithful. And this one is on the Northeast entrance was collected in the, uh, or observed in the um, uh, Lamar Valley. And this one is from Rainy Lake, which is between Tower Junction and, Can and Canyon. And in the northern end of their range in Yellowstone, you occasionally run into these uh, very light colored tiger salamanders. It's called amelanism or leucism. And uh, we're, we'll talk about that. We see something like that with spadefoot uh, toad larvae too. So quite a bit of color variation uh, in these. Uh, here's the distribution for the Western uh, tiger, uh, tiger salamander. And as I said, that's been broken down. There's now other species that go pretty much across the, uh, across the uh, country. They occur pretty much across Wyoming, as you can see in this dot distribution map. And then here's a, an older map. This is a dot distribution map uh, showing in green the observations and in red the museum records for uh, tiger salamanders in Yellowstone National Park. This map's about 25 um, years old. This is from our book on the amphibians and reptiles of Yellowstone. And we're um, Revive, we're just getting ready to start revising that, that, that book uh, now, and we have a much more complete understanding of distribution. There's been a lot of research on amphibians done in Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks in the last 25 years, so we know quite a bit more about that. Uh, here's examples of habitat. These are what we call pond breeding or still water breeding amphibians. Uh, you'll find them in fishless lakes and in uh, beaver ponds and in uh, a variety of types of ponds. This is a kettle pond in the northern range uh, of, of, uh, of Yellowstone. And they're basically, they don't do very well with fish at all. The fish can eat the eggs and the larvae. And uh, salamander larvae are predaceous. They're, they're not like the uh, toad and uh, frog tadpoles that primarily feed on vegetation and are often on the bottom. The, the salamander larvae have to be feeding in the water column for the most part, and then they're easily preyed upon by the fit, by fish. So typically where you find lakes with fish, uh, the um, salamanders either won't be in those lakes or they're in lakes that have a lot of structure to them that allow them to avoid them. But uh, anyway, the, this is really like good amphibian habitat that, that you're seeing here. Beaver ponds are especially good places for amphibians to breed. Okay, and then here's what the uh, eggs look like for tiger salamanders. You may see individual eggs or you may see them in a, kind of a linear arrangement here along the um, uh, attached 
to, uh, for example, a, a, a stem or a branch uh, of vegetation. And they normally, they, they, they're laying the eggs in the springtime and at lower elevations earlier and then at higher elevations later. And then the eggs hatch within about a month. And that's going to depend on the temperature. Uh, here are what the developing embryos uh, look like. Um, it, with salamanders, they get the salamander larvae, they get their front limbs first. Um, these guys, you can actually see these are, there's the limb right there developing. That is an external gill. And that's the easiest way to tell salamander larvae apart from a, a frog and toad larvae is that they have these uh, external gills after they're uh, a couple days old. Um, and uh, then they develop like this, then they hatch and then they'll grow up to getting, these are pretty, pretty large larvae here. The, lar the larvae can actually may take up to several years to transform and they can get even bigger than the uh, transformed uh, uh, adults are. But you can see this distinct feature here of the uh, external gills. And that's how they're respiring. They don't transition to lungs until they're undergoing uh, metamorphosis. Um, you see that they have four legs and a tail, not too much color. They tend to be kind of unicolor while, while they're larvae. Um, they, there's a very interesting phenomenon called pedomorphosis or neoteny. Those terms tend to be used uh, interchangeably and in different ways by different uh, people. But what, what they're describing here is the attainment of a reproductive uh, maturity and ability to reproduce as in the larval form. So in, in some locations in the park, particularly above 7,000 feet in uh, lakes that or ponds that don't have fish, they may not metamorphose at all. And they may just remain in this larval stage and breed like that or they might uh, metamorphose and, uh, later too. So there's a lot of, of variation uh, in that. A very interesting evolutionary process uh, called, uh, generally called heterochrony and, uh, and, and in this case called pedomorphosis or, or, or uh, neoteny. Okay, so that's the salamander. Here's a, a, a western toad. Um, these can get quite large. Of the native species in, in, in the greater Yellowstone, uh, these are the, uh, the a neuron that, that gets the largest. These females can get up to five inches in, uh, in, in, in length from what we call the snout Euro style length from the tip of the nose down to the, the back of the body here. The brown color can vary quite a bit. Some of them are green, some are brown. This one's brown. They may be grayish or even blackish sometime. Most of them have a light vertebral stripe that goes down, that goes down the back. And they're characterized by a dry, what we call warty skin. These really are not warts. They're concentrations of poison glands. And those protect them from uh, predation, uh, either by organisms like fish or birds or, or mammals or, or, or even uh, many snakes. Uh, the uh, co a large concentration of these poison glands occurs right behind the eye. These are called paratoid glands. And if you encounter a toad, sometimes you'll notice that they'll, they, they tend not to run away. They face you and they'll tilt their head down and, and present these. And uh, this is a, a toxin and it can make uh, the predator sick or it might even, uh, might even uh, uh, kill them. So, 
this is their way. This, uh, this is one of the anurans that's able to breed and coexist with like trout in rivers. So you'll find these guys breeding in back channels of rivers where the other amphibians won wouldn't be able to because they'd be eaten by fish. But again, this, this uh, squatty body and these um, uh, tubercle or these uh, uh, poison gland concentrations are pretty distinctive. They also have a, they're the only amphibian in uh, Yellowstone that has a horizontally elliptical pupil. Uh, this is a species that's uh, widespread, goes all the way up into Alaska and down, I think all the way, yeah, down into Baja and goes east like into Colorado and, and Wyoming. So it's a widespread species. This group down in here, this is probably a separate species and uh, may someday be described as its own species, but we're in the main part of the range uh, uh, for the, the Western toad. And so here you can see that Southern population. This one is in a lot of trouble and has been considered for endangered species status. And some of these may probably be in that, actually genetically in that Southern population. And then here are the ones. Uh, Western toads have undergone, uh, um, let's see, I, I, I forgot to mention this for tiger salamanders. Tiger salamanders appear to have undergone a, a couple of population declines, things that we call bottlenecks uh, within the last few hundred years. One may have been uh, associated with the introduction of, uh, of uh, fish to many of the previously fishless water for fishing opportunities. And then also there has been uh, recent declines in salamanders uh, with uh, disease, possibly ranavirus. In Western toads, they've been affected by this chytrid fungus. And uh, particularly that Southern population has almost gone, disappeared. It's disappeared like from uh, New Mexico, quite a bit of Utah, most of Colorado. And there appear to be less uh, Western toads than there were like 50 years ago, but uh, the, they're, they're still persisting uh, in, in, in the Yellowstone uh, ecosystem. Um, here's a, a, uh, other examples of toad habitat. This is, uh, you saw that before when this was a uh, beaver pond. And this has all, it, this has all of the species except spadefoot toads in it. This is actually down just south of Yellowstone. Uh, on Ditch Creek by, by the Teton Science School. Uh, here's a, a big beaver pond that was a really productive toad breeding site uh, in um, uh, Grand Teton National Park. This is actually a side channel. This is Schwabacher Landing. You may be familiar with that site. And uh, this is a real dynamic. These to toads are associated uh, they're kind of a disturbance species. So uh, you have them forming, uh, you have them breeding like in beaver ponds and beaver ponds, you know, come and go. This, this dam eventually went away and then they had to go find somewhere else to, to breed. Uh, quarries, burrow pits. When Mount St. Helens went off, that disturbed, you know, obviously Mount St. Helens, the volcano did. And afterwards, the, the Western toad populations exploded. It's very interesting too, that sometimes we have um, uh, with blowouts on creeks, particularly like following, uh, oh, fires, um, Western toad breeding uh, seems to go up after fires in some places in the Western United States. Uh, this is uh, over by the Gibbon River. This is a tributary of the Gibbon River, geothermally uh, influenced water. And um, uh, this is a good breeding site for them. This is near Elk or in Elk Meadows. Here's at the south entrance to Yellowstone. 
This is a creek that uh, has uh, geothermally influenced and we find uh, uh, toads breeding in this area quite a bit. And in our initial studies back in the 1990s, we discovered that by looking at the water chemistry, that the toads uh, are, their, their uh, successful breeding is very highly correlated with uh, geothermal activity and uh, high salinity waters, high total dissolved solids. And so virtually all of the places that we know of where they're successfully breeding have much, much higher levels of uh, dissolved solids. And that along possibly with some of the, the, the temperature, that may help protect them from uh, the fungal diseases or at least the effects of the fungal disease. The chytrid fungus attaches, attacks the keratin, the structural protein in the skin and their ability to regulate uh, their water balance and the solutes uh, is disrupted with that chytrid fungus. And in, with these uh, high osmolality waters, that it, it isn't as much of a, a osmotic stress on them. So uh, for some reason, their successful breeding now seems to be highly associated with these geothermal there's some other, some of the other species tend to be uh, more associated with higher conductivity waters too. We have our first question, Chuck. Um, someone is asking about what is the chemical composition of the toxin that is found within poison glands of the toads? Um, I don't know a great deal about that. Um, there is one that's called a bufotoxin. Uh, and I think, I, I think what I would do is I would basically Google that and, 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 and look it up. I don't know the details of the chemical, uh, structure, but you know, almost all amphibians have toxins and poisons in their skin. Some of that's involved with, you know, uh, combating bacteria or, uh, fung fungus. And then some of them are really, really potent for, uh, you know, anti-predators. Uh, the we have a newt in the northwest called the rough-skinned newt, and the toxin that it has is a um, called um, tetrodotoxin. It's the same one that's involved in the um, uh, with the pufferfish, and it, it seems to be the result, uh, I think, of a symbiotic relationship with the um, uh, with the bacteria uh, but the the bufotoxin itself I don't know too much um, uh, too much about that that's a good question I'll look that up later but uh, and if someone wants to email me I can try to give you an answer that way but other than telling you that it's a bufotoxin and I think it might be an alkaloid but I, I don't know much more I, I don't know any more than that Okay, so here, here, here are some uh, Western toads. This is kind of atypical. This one doesn't have the brown stripe or the light stripe down the back. Uh, but here are some Western toads that are breeding. The male is here on top. He's in amplexus with the female who is larger. And she's laying down uh, dual strings of eggs, one string per, per over, oviduct. And a friend of mine, Bryce Maxell, he, he uh, actually encountered a toad in Montana that was laying eggs. So he sat there and I think for four or five hours counted, uh, I think of the eggs by, by the length of the, the, the uh, egg string. And he estimated that that female laid 12,000 eggs. Um, there's details we won't go into about the jelly structure that can allow you to distinguish them from others. But the, you can distinguish the toad eggs from all the other uh, egg uh, types in, uh, in Yellowstone from the fact that they're laid in these strings. 
and they're, they may be wound around vegetation, but often they're just laid right on a muddy or a sandy bottom. Uh, this particular spot, this is Indian Pond, just at the north end of Yellowstone Lake near Fishing Bridge. And that this uh, pond is heavily geothermally influenced and these toads lay the eggs in high conductivity water in the southeast corner of, of Indian Pond. Now in this part of their range, as far as we know, the western toads do not use a call for advertising. The males come into the ponds and then the females and then uh, the females come later but as far as we know they don't they're not like chorus frogs or spotted frogs or spadefoots that have what we call an advertisement call. These guys have a release call and a Apparently these, these males are so awash in testosterone that they'll grab anything that moves and try to mate with it. And they often end up grabbing each other. And uh, then they have a release call that uh, they make to let the other male know that he's, uh, that, that, that he's grabbed another male. It sounds a bit like a bird call to me. Uh, this was, this tape was made on the Buffalo River, and I'm holding the, this male in uh, my hands, and then the, uh, the um, toad is uh, giving me the release call, trying to get me to let him go. Uh, one of my PhD students studied these for a number of years, and he put little miniature radio transmitters and fanny packs on them. And when we were testing out the effect of the um, belt for attaching them, the first time we put one on the toad, we put it on too tight. He ended up jumping around his cage for about an hour, uh, giving that release call. Okay, like I said, they have thousands of eggs and you can have hundreds of uh, toads breeding. Uh, there, there's some so, so there's a few places where you have high uh, high population densities of these toads, so particularly uh, east east of the Tetons is where we've seen the largest ones. But there's some pretty good uh, toad breeding sites within Yellowstone. So you often find these large schools, these little dark tadpoles. The tadpoles. Uh, there's so many of them that they tend to be quite small, even though it's a, it's a big toad, the, the tadpoles and the little metamorphs are, are little toadlets are quite, quite small. And I've seen these, some of them in river and oxbows there, where they, it goes hundreds of meters, you know, there's hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of these, of these uh, tadpoles. And you can tell them from the other tadpoles because they're just jet black. It was hard, hard to see any pattern at all. They're just very, very dark. And then this is what the little, the little guys look like. This is a uh, Western toad. We call them, uh, well, while they're undergoing metamorphosis and they're transitioning from the larval stage to terrestrial stage, they're called metamorphs. These are actually toadlets here. They're recently metamorphs. But they're like maybe half an inch long, something like that. They have the yellow on the feet. We think that's probably warning coloration. They have these orange spots on the back. And they are toxic at this stage. So this is probably what protects them from the fish and gives them chemical defenses. And then this area right here, that dark area, that's called the pelvic patch. And that's a highly permeable skin that allows water to pass through. So they can pick up water through this portion of the skin like four or five times as easily as they can absorb it through other parts of their skin. Okay, so that's the Western toad. Now, the, this is the plain spade foot. Um, these are in a family called the Scaphiopodidae, uh, or, uh, and, um, it, it, notice these guys have a vertical pupil. They're not true toads, but we sometimes call them toads. 
Um, their skin is smoother, but they still have these toxic poison glands. A friend of mine who was uh, working actually in the birds of prey area, somebody, he was at a party and somebody dropped a, a, a great basin spade foot in his, in his glass of beer and trying to be a macho guy, he went ahead and drank the beer while the toad was in it and he nearly suffocated it. Uh, it closed off his throat and he had trouble swallowing and, and breathing. So these guys have toxic uh, properties to their uh, skin secretions as well. But that vertical pupil and then the distinctive feature and the feature that they get their name from is this dark little protuberance here on the hind foot. That's the underside of the hind foot. These guys burrow and they dig down into, into the soil and uh, they can dig down like nine, 10 feet down in, into the ground. And in drought periods, they just stay underground. So they may be underground for months, possibly even years, if the conditions are, are, are such. They're opportunistic breeders. They come out and explosively breed uh, just within a few days, typically. And then, they, then the adults disappear. They hibernate underground. And they basically only come out when they're either breeding or and typically when it's raining, and that's when, uh, when they forage. So uh, a wildlife photographer saw one back in the early 80s along the Fairy Falls Trail in the west side of Yellowstone in the Midway Geyser Basin. And um, he, uh, he gave a, a photo and a rare animal observation to the Park Service. The photo was lost, so on our map, when we were writing our book, we put a question mark there. But then in 2012, uh, uh, 2012 or 2013, this was, uh, it was uh, discovered, the, the uh, amphibian or the wildlife disease group uh, out of uh, Yellowstone National Park, out of Mammoth, they, they found a little metamorph there. And then since then, uh, it's been located, the calling has been recorded. So this is uh, this pond that's along the Fairy Falls Trail where the spadefoots occur. There's actually multiple ponds now that are known where they, uh, where they occur. That was published uh, that a, a Northwestern naturalist the confirmation of that species in the park. I find that really exciting that even now we're discovering new species in the park. Chuck, uh, the toxins in the glands, um, another toxins questions. Um, is that permeable and constantly being secreted or does the toad have to actively uh, trigger that mechanism to leach uh, toxins? They, they actively, they, they're not, it's a, I think it's probably a pretty expensive thing to create. And, and so they, they basically uh, are sequestering that in those, those glands and they generally do not release it. Now, when you, let, let me go back to the Western toad here. Let me see if I've got a close up of the skin. And I don't have a close enough one, but there's little pores on these glands. And when a toad gets really upset, you'll see that a white fluid come oozing out of those pores, and that's the toxin. And uh, amphibians have a variety of ways. Some of the salamanders, actually, that's under pressure, and they can spray it out of their skin if they're sufficiently uh, disturbed. And there's one, there's a spiny salamander from Asia where the ribs will puncture the poison gland, and then they basically create a wound that that poison goes into the predator from. So uh, chemical defenses are a very important, very important part of uh, the anti-predator adaptations for, for amphibians. Um, I, I got this. This is uh, actually from, uh, oh, this was done back, I think, in the 50s or so. Uh, 
uh, recordings by Charles Bogert, who was from the American Museum of Natural History, the herpetologist. And he did the uh, sounds of North American frogs. And here's the mating call for the plain spadefoot. And this is quite a bit different than the mating call for the um, uh, spotted uh, or for the, the Great Basin spadefoot. totally different call from that of the smaller plains baitfoot. Were you able to hear that? It came through a little bit. It was a little soft, but I think we did hear it. Okay, well, if you want to, uh, I, you know, uh -oh, three. stop that. <laughs> um, I put the link there. This actually links to a YouTube, so you must be hearing it through my microphone. Um, uh, anyway, uh, you can click on that and, and, and you can listen to it or enter that. I don't think when I give you the PDF. Um, Corey, will you be able to post a, a PDF so people can get it? Do you have a place on your website that you can do that? Yeah, there, there is a way that we can make a clickable link to that, um, and I, I'm happy to do that. Okay. All right. And then, uh, oh, in fact, I'm hoping to go up to Yellowstone in another couple weeks that they're probably breeding right now in, in Yellowstone. And here's a tadpole uh, there at Fairy Falls uh, Trail Pond. And uh, these tadpoles get pretty big. Um, the eyes are kind of here on the top of the head. They have a little distinctive marking on the head. And they're basically like a swimming intestine. You know, they, they're, they're just eating as much as they can. Often the ponds that they breed in dry up quickly, so they metamorphose fast. The eggs can hatch in a matter of days, and or and and the larvae can transform like in as little as two weeks. So they're very very fast uh, developing, and they have a very interesting adaptation. Some of them, where some of the individuals develop what's called the cannibal morph and they have basically predatory jaws rather than filtering or scraping mouth parts and uh, they will eat other tadpoles and it's believed that that accelerates their development and the cannibals may be able to metamorphose earlier than the other ones and then here's a really nice example of a leucistic uh, very light colored, not an albino, see the eyes aren't pink, but uh, a leucistic uh, plain spade foot. And uh, we've got an article that's going to be coming out in Herpetological Review. I think it's going to come out this month. But here's a photograph of a normally colored one and a leucistic one. And we think that this is probably just an abnormality, a uh, simple mutation that interferes with the production of melanin, which is a dark pigment. And then this is looking at these guys on the, the belly side in the net. Here's someone's finger so you can get a sense of scale. There's the mouth and the keratinized structures. One of the ways that you can uh, sometimes tell if uh, uh, the larvae have been affected by the chytrid fungus is these, they're so-called teeth, they're not real teeth, they're keratin structures, and those can get disrupted and disformed by the chytrid fungus as well. But here you can see the intestine. These guys are primarily feeding on, um, on uh, plant material, and uh, they have just a really very high metabolism, they're moving around a lot, and they're digesting food really quickly. And I don't think I have a picture of a metamorph here, so we're going to go right over into the, the boreal uh, uh, chorus frog.
So this is a hylid, a type of tree frog. These guys have very tiny toe pads. You, hard, you have to look for them really carefully to see them. And they're polymorphic. So some of them are green, some of them are brown, and some of them are a mixture of green and brown. And they generally have three stripes or three lines of broken spots down the back. The, this used, the species used to be called, it was, before it was split up, was called Triceriata. Now it's called Maculata for the spots. Uh, they're small, about an inch and a half long. They, they make more noise than any of the other amphibians. They have a pretty loud call. Uh, anyway, very, very uh, delightful little frog. And they're calling, I'm sure, in the park right now. Here's the distribution of, of, of that species. And it's found throughout Wyoming, found pretty much throughout the, uh, throughout the parks. So it, it's a real, uh, but they're, they're primarily in shallow waters with emergent vegetation. That's the kind of place that, 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 that you find them. We also have found them breeding in uh, little lagoons uh, and uh, the pools that form behind the sand dunes on uh, uh, Yellowstone Lake. Uh, and this, this is the species that's really affected heavily by the snowpack. A lot of these ponds, you know, they're, there's primarily precipitation, either in the form of snow or rain that forms those, uh, those ponds. And in dry years, low snowfall years, these, uh, these uh, ponds may not uh, uh, form, they may be totally dry. So you can see the number of sites where chorus frogs are breeding uh, vary by three, four fold from year to year, depending on uh, how dry or how, how, how wet it is. This is a species that still seems to be holding its own. Um, I, I mentioned toads declining, uh, population declines with tiger salamanders. Uh, with chorus frogs, uh, for the most part, uh, they're highly variable depending on the, the water conditions, but they don't seem to have been as affected as much by uh, disease or, uh, or, or other factors. Uh, here is the call, and any of you been outside in Yellowstone in the spring have probably heard this. Whoop. There we go. That's not the right call. That's, I inserted the wrong call there. I, I, I got the, that's the uh, Pacific tree frog. It's a rigid. Um, I don't think I have time. This one was the original one. That was what I tried to replace. We'll just have to, uh, I'll, I'll put a link to the correct one in there for you. Uh, I, I should have checked that carefully. Anyway, here's a chorus frog. They inflate their vocal pouch here. That's the male. And you can hear them a quarter of a mile away. That It's really a, 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 a loud call. And uh, the females lay about 50 eggs in these little clusters about an inch below the surface of the water in clear water and they attach them. These can be pretty hard to find. Uh, like toad eggs, easy to find. Spotted frog eggs, easy to find. These eggs, they're, they're, you have to really know what you're looking for to, to find them. And then they met them, or they, then you have the, the tadpoles. And you can tell the tadpoles of boreal chorus frogs because their eyes are right on the edge. Remember that tadpole I showed you for the, uh, spot, uh, the spade foot? His eyes or its eyes were here on more meat, more internally located. These guys, it's right on the edge. Sometimes you, you, people refer to them as like Volkswagen Beetle headlights. You know, they're right on the edge and bulging out. But that makes them uh, easy to uh, identify. Oops, stop that. 
Okay, here's uh, the Columbia spotted frog. This is the last of the species that are confirmed for Yellowstone. It's a medium sized frog, a little bit smaller than a leopard frog, about three and a half inches for the body length here. Uh, green tan or olive dorsum. And this is very interesting. This frog and, and on the chorus frogs too, they can be light or dark depending on the temperature and kind of their emotional stage. They have the ability to modify their color, at least the lightness or darkness of it to some time. They have these spots, dark irregular spots on the back with light spots in the middle. Uh, and that's kind of uh, fuzzy. And if you turn them over, the adults often have coloration here on the belly and in the groin area. Uh, and on the legs. Their eyes also tend to be more upturned than say leopard frogs are and so they have uh, a somewhat different appearance. I can't see it here very well but they have very well developed webbing. This is an aquatic frog. Uh, all of the species that I've talked about except this one are terrestrial hibernators. This one requires oxygenated non-freezing water to make it through the winter. So they typically will be associated with springs or a moving river or stream where they'll hibernate uh, underwater. Um, this is the distribution for the Columbia spotted frog. And it basically found in Northwestern Wyoming and they occur pretty much throughout the frog. This is the frog that you're most likely to see. The chorus frog is the one you're most likely to hear, but this is the frog that you most often see. In fact, this is the amphibian that you most often see in Yellowstone. Uh, here is examples of uh, habitat. This is a fishless lake. This is a uh, Harlequin Lake. Beautiful little lake uh, just north the Madison, uh, West Yellowstone Highway is running through that and this is about oh maybe a quarter half mile hike uh, up up uh, up toward Purple Mountain uh, and here's the lake and this has chorus frogs tiger salamanders and spotted frogs uh, uh, in it and uh, the spotted frogs will breed I'll show you a picture of a communal nesting area that was found right in this, this area here. But a lake with emergent vegetation, fishless, very nice spotted frog habitat. Uh, here is a uh, beaver pond in the northwest part of uh, Yellowstone. And they'll breed in these beaver ponds. And then they'll spread out into these wet meadows and they'll forage along creeks and along riverbanks. Usually the adults, you typically find them within a meter or so of the water. But they can get out and go. Um, actually, some of the, uh, the females will travel up to a couple of kilometers sometimes up to higher mountain lakes and things to spend the summer foraging for, for invertebrates. Uh, here's the, um, uh, okay, here's the call. Let's see if I, this can... okay, it's a, it's a relatively quiet call and kind of a knocking sound. I've only heard it a few times. It's not a call that is easy to use for monitoring like the chorus frog calls or leopard frog calls. Here's a egg mass right as it's been laid. Now, you may wonder how a big mass like that comes from this size frog. This is all dehydrated basically when they lay the eggs and then it hydrates, it absorbs water and then floats to the surface. And this is a species where sometimes you'll have multiple females. In fact, we found communal frog nests like over in Montana with over a hundred females have contributed uh, to that. Um, Typically, a female will lay hundreds of eggs per mass, and the eggs will hatch in a few weeks, depending on the, the, the temperature. Sometimes uh, the eggs early in the year, they're, they're uh, killed by freezing, or the water may drop, and they may dry out. 
uh, and then they may be attacked by uh, a fungus, a water fungus. That can happen uh, and that can kill healthy eggs too. So sometimes you find that all the eggs have been ruined by a, by a fungus. Here are the, the, the larvae. Again, notice the head here, uh, the, the eyes are medial, the flecking of the, 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 the color here. And then here's a metamorph. This is a great slide. David Pilliad took this picture and it shows the limbs are there, but it still has the tail. So it's in the process of transforming into a, a little froglet. Okay, so that's it. Are there, before we go on, are there any questions? About, oh, let me uh, let me double back here too, and talk just to mention a little bit uh, about the status of the Columbia spotted frog. Uh, what twenty five years ago, the 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 Oregon spotted frog and the Columbia spotted frog were all considered one species, and they were split out. The Oregon spotted frog has been largely lost throughout most of its range, and it's in a, it has, uh, I think, threatened species status. The Columbia spotted frog was considered for threatened species status. The northern part of its range, it's done fairly well, but in this part of its range, it's, the distribution is all broken up and uh, they've been really affected by drought and drying conditions. So for a number of years, these were considered candidate species or uh, species that were uh, of considerable concern. But uh, there's been quite a bit of work done to help them. And I think, I think that they're tending to do relatively well or holding their own in, in some of those places. Uh, in Yellowstone, there's still a lot of spotted frogs left, but they've been one that they've been really been hit by disease, uh, particularly ranavirus. And there have been multiple um, disease incidents, die-offs of uh, spotted frogs. Also tiger salamanders too, where mass die-offs have been uh, documented. So Yellowstone has its issues with amphibian diseases. Okay, so we started doing our amphibian monitoring work out of the ISU Herpetology Lab in 1992. And uh, then with help from the US Geological Survey and the National Park Service, we collaborated with them to help establish a longer term. We did help with the inventory program that started in 2000 and then establishing the amphibian monitoring program. And the Park Service runs that now. Uh, it was started with the help of the U.S. Geological Survey. And uh, this is one of the premier amphibian monitoring programs in North America. Uh, it's been going now for almost two decades. And uh, it's the, the park has what they call, there's a invent, the Greater Yellowstone Inventory and Monitoring Program. It's separate program from say Yellowstone or Grand Teton National Parks themselves. They're located uh, in Bozeman, but they coordinate what's called the Vital Signs Monitoring Program. And there's seven different vital signs. There's water, chemistry, and there's, white bark pine, and the, I think there's some of the birds, and amphibians are one of those uh, seven vital signs. And um, uh, they have, uh, I, I got some slides. Andrew Ray is the ecologist with that program. And uh, he has, he's the one that primarily has been working on that. But it's been a very productive program. They've uh, kept it going for a long time, which is unusual for long-term monitoring for amphibians. Usually you get these things started and then eventually people lose interest or funding and then it, it goes by the wayside. But it's they've done a good job of continuing it there. So I grabbed a few slides. Now the reason that the amphibians are part of the monitoring program is because it integrates so many different things from climate, 
radiation, contaminants, parasites, diseases, introduced species, all of these things are influencing it. So the amphibians can be telling you something about a variety of different, what they call drivers. And uh, they uh, have uh, set up a stratified random sampling design where they go in and do complete surveys. I think they're doing 31 what are called catchments, catchments or sub watersheds. And then they calculate whether or not there's breeding activity going there. And uh, I don't really have time to, to go into this, in, into the details. There's a lot of variation, uh, amphibian disease, but the, well, the climate change, drying, those are considered to be one of the, the main threats with the, uh, to wetlands, and then uh, for uh, the salamanders and for the uh, the spotted frogs, there have been uh, documented die-offs. And some of the population monitoring for western toads has indicated long-term uh, decline at, at some of the monitoring sites there. So anyway, this is, uh, if you're interested in this, I'll, I'll give you a link where you can find out more about what they're doing. The last thing I wanted to mention here is the, uh, uh, that's intense monitoring what the Park Service is doing. We also still need to know a lot about just where these species occur. And that's where the public can come in and help. And there's a, a very nice um, program called iNaturalist, which uses a website and mobile devices. And uh, two, two years ago, we started a Greater Yellowstone Amphibian and Reptile iNaturalist project, and you can contribute observations to there. And there's a couple hundred observations in there, and there's a couple hundred more that need to be added. So we're starting to build up a nice database of geo-referenced photographs of amphibians from around and reptiles from around the set. Here's a toad from the Lamar Valley. There, uh, iNaturalist was is uh, was started as a master's project at the University of California Berkeley by people that wanted to document and share their observations. It's uh, sponsored by the California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic, and it primarily uses mobile devices to document observations of organism, organisms. Those can be photographs, they can be recordings, GPS coordinates. You can identify things, but you don't need to. You can just put up the photograph and then people will help you identify it. And it's easy to share. It's sort of like a social network for naturalists and you can share your observations with friends and organizations in the public. Uh, you can download the app from the Play Store or the App Store, or you can enter your observations via a website. And this is a big program. Uh, the biggest program like this for citizen science is eBird for documenting uh, bird observations, and that's run by the Cornell Ornithological Laboratory. For, for other organisms, this is the biggest one. Uh, this is, uh, as of today, there are over 39 million observations of, of around 280,000 species, and they've been made by over a million observers. And uh, this is just a map of where those observations have occurred. So if you're interested in that, you can look you can look at inaturalist.org and there's all kinds of help materials available. It's a great, we use it to teach our classes now in uh, amphibians and reptiles and in plants identification and things like that. So and if any of you are interested in this or would like some help with it, just feel free to email me. Uh, for more information, uh, this book came out in 1995. It's still available on uh, Amazon for about five bucks and then I think it's five bucks of ship or four bucks for shipping. Uh, you can download, this is a whole issue of Yellowstone Science. I think it was from January or so or maybe last fall, but it has a chapter in there on the amphibian monitoring 
uh, program and you can download that from that link or just put in Yellowstone Science in Google and it'll take you uh, to that site. So that is all I have, but I'm more than happy to entertain questions. So thank you. Chuck, one uh, question that we have is um, what invasive amphibian species are in the, uh, the sites that you monitor? Um, and also kind of expanding off of that, um, if not uh, invasive amphibian species, what other invasive species affect the native amphibian populations? Okay, yeah, there's a number of things. Uh, introduced species are a major problem. Now, in Yellowstone, I'm not aware of any introduced amphibian species. Down in the Tetons, in the, around Kelly Warm Springs, uh, there's uh, bullfrogs were introduced. And I don't know if they're much of a problem there, but the, there are bullfrogs present there. Elsewhere in the Western United States, basically bullfrogs are native east of the Continental Divide. They've been introduced widely in the West, uh, like here in Idaho, all along Snake River Canyon, up into Northern Idaho, there's a lot of bullfrogs and they'll just eat the other frogs. Unfortunately, they're also a carrier. They're not affected by the chytrid fungus, but they're a carrier of the fungus. So they may be spreading the disease. Down in the Southwestern United States, bullfrogs are a major problem. And I think they've actually caused other species of ran and true frogs to go extinct there. So among the amphibians, I would say that, you know, uh, uh, at least in the greater Yellowstone, Western, or the, the bullfrogs would be the one that you would be uh, concerned about. Um, other introduced species, well, of course, fish are, are probably the biggest problem for amphibians in the West. Uh, over 95% of the fishless waters in high elevation areas have, have been stocked with fish for recreational fishing. And uh, they have had, you know, serious impacts on uh, native amphibian uh, populations. So that's probably the biggest thing. Uh, crayfish have been a problem. Um, the chytrid fungus is, uh, that, that's affecting things now is believed to not be native. That's believed to have been introduced. And exactly the route of that is not clear, but it might have involved um, um, uh, uh, amphibians that were either bullfrogs or South African fro clawed frogs that acquired uh, particular virulent strains of the chytrid fungus in captivity and then got released and it, it waterfall may play a role in, in dispersing, dispersing it. And then there's uh, some of the, I know, I don't know if this is a problem in Yellowstone, but I know over in Washington, canary grass has been introduced and that's affected the, the habitat uh, quite a bit. So that, that's, those are kind of the things that come to my mind uh, would be bullfrogs, predatory fish, um, some plant species, and then some of the disease organisms. What are, uh, what are the benefits to communal egg laying or nesting? It seems like uh, having those masses of egg pods would attract uh, potential predators to those uh, those masses. So, what would be the benefits of um, of laying eggs in masses? Oh, I think it's primarily a thermal benefit. That uh, the uh, the light shines through that clear uh, that 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 clear uh, jelly coat, and it hits the dark. The egg itself is pigmented, and so it heats up. And it's, uh, I think, a surface area volume ratio uh, relationship. And so in those egg masses, the temperature can get five, six degrees, maybe even more Celsius warmer. I've measured the temperature differences between the edge and the center of those, and they're much warmer. And so that means that they'll develop quite a bit faster. 
uh, it, it could maybe speed up the development by a week or something, I, I believe. And so with Remember, the they're laying those eggs in primarily fishless habitats, too. Right. Um, with uh, so many of these um, species laying in the thousands of eggs, um, do they have a very short lifespan? No, no. Interestingly enough, they have real high mortality, you know, as tadpoles and as little metamorphs. But the, um, the lifespan is, is quite significant. Um, the chorus frogs are probably the shortest lived. They probably only live a few years, maybe five years. The spotted frogs in Yellowstone probably live into their teens. The tiger salamanders live into their teens. The, um, my dogs are barking. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Um, the, uh, the Western toads, they can live into their 20s. So some of these are, are pretty. And then, uh, you know, some of the longest lived amphibians are like giant salamanders that, you know, can live over 50 years. So some of these things, generally, ten, the cooler the environment they're in, the higher elevation, they live quite a bit longer. Spotted frogs that are down by the coast, they, they probably don't even live to be five years long. But up in Yellowstone, they're not, females probably aren't even sexually mature until they're five years old. And uh, one more for you here. Your favorite amphibian species of all time. Oh, that's tough. You know, I, I, I like them all so much. I, uh, I really like Western toads. I, uh, Western toads have a lot of character. I've kept some of them in the lab. They have a lot of personality. And uh, they're, they're just, uh, I think part of the reason maybe is that they're toxic and they're just not as afraid of people as much. And so you don't get a lot of the escape behaviors with them that you get with the, uh, you know, like a leopard frog or something. He's just trying to jump away from you and they're real nervous. So I, I really like Western toads. I'm very attracted to spadefoots as well. If there's any uh, additional questions from the audience, please feel free to uh, post those up in the Zoom uh, Q&A now. Um, otherwise, I am going to switch uh, the screen here. And go to here. And then I will also attempt to launch this. There we go. Um, so again, uh, if you have any questions uh, following this presentation, please feel free to reach out uh, to myself or Dr. Peterson and we will get those questions relayed. Um, I want to, uh, again, extend my gratitude uh, to Dr. Charles Peterson for joining us today virtually um, over Zoom, uh, to Sage Creek Ranch, as well as the Nancy Carroll Draper Charitable Foundation for making these programs possible. Um, if you would like to be included in uh, email announcements for upcoming presentations, um, please just send me a, uh, an email to the link below there, um, and we will get your name added to the list. Uh, this uh, uh, presentation is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube um, this afternoon, and we'll include links to those, uh, the calls, um, iNaturalist, as well as to um, Dr. Peterson's uh, uh, photography site there with the uh, other records of amphibians and reptiles as well. Um, so please make sure to check back for that link um, and as well as a link for this presentation will be sent out in an upcoming email. So thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you again soon.